Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of the Burning Desire Show. Um, and today I am really honoured to have, well, your official title is Dr. Andy Gotts, correct? Um, Absolutely. Do you go as Dr. Andy in any way, shape or form? Only on social media. Social right. media, my handle is Dr. Gotts, um, because there are, even though Gotts isn't a usual surname, there's still three or four Andy Gotts floating around. So How dare uh, they? How dare I know, they? I know. And I met one. I was, a Gotts is a Norfolk name. Okay. And I'm, from, I'm from Norfolk, but uh, in the 11th century, a Gotts was someone who kept horses dry in the stables. And, and, and so it, it's a Norfolk Fen's name. And obviously in Norfolk, there's a few Gotts hanging around. Ah. Uh. Okay, okay. Well, uh, thankfully, I got the one that I was looking for. So I was just saying before in the kind of pre of this recording, um, how I came to yourself was literally, I think it was only last week, maybe a touch, maybe it was a week before, I saw the article on the BBC about you photographing all the current, all the, the all the 007 villains, past and present. Um, and I was just like, wow, this is really, really cool. Um, and me being me, I'm like, let's see where this guy's at. So like, I just Google around, find your website, email you and, you know, you, you got back and this, this is what happens. And I think the lesson there for a lot of people is like, you can reach out to people that are maybe you wouldn't expect. And so quite a lot of people will come back to you. You know what I mean? Like, um, so I'm humbled by that. And, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to have a conversation with you. Really. My pleasure. I mean, I find myself to be quite a, a, a ninja of photography uh, because I kind of, I, I've, I've hidden in the shadows for over 30 years. Okay. And there are some photographers who do exactly what I do, um, who caught the, 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 the fame side and the celebrity side, and they do the red carpets, they do the parties, they do this. Uh, I kind of like to do my job and go home. Uh, so, so I'm very under the radar. I, um, in the industry of acting and music, I'm well known. The outer world, not so much. And that's how, that's how, how I've enjoyed it for 30 years. I can do my job, because it is a job, and go home. So I, I normally do start at the beginning, but something because of of who you are and what you do, I have to ask you. So behind you, now some people will listen to this, and most people will watch it possibly. But there are three. Uh, well, there's definitely two portraits, and the third one is also the yeah, middle one is a portrait too. And I got to ask you because you must have taken I don't know how many people's photographs. Why have you chosen those three to be in? I presume you're in some sort of part of your apartment or something. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so um, this is my office. These three are here because they've been uh, signed to me. So I, I, all these people I know, I know Kate Moss, I know Monty Python, and I know um, uh, Mr. Kane, and um, they're all friends of mine. And right. so, and so, for example, the shot of Monty Python, that was the last ever shot taken to Monty Python. That was the right. last ever, ever shot. Right. And they all signed it at the bottom, and, and they've never signed anything before to anyone. And and, and, one, and this, this one of uh, Michael Caine, uh, for your listeners, it's a picture of Michael Caine mimicking the David Bailey shot from the 1960s with the Harry Palmer glasses, the black coat. And for years and years and years, I, I was saying, Michael, can we ever emulate the picture? It was always no, or to me, to anyone, it's always no, I've done it once with Bailey, never again. And so I was doing a project about five years ago and Michael was going to be involved. And I felt the time before I was kind of wearing him down a little bit. But I thought, <laughs> you know. So um, I phoned up his wife, Shakira, and I said, Shakira, does Michael still have the Harry Palmer glasses? And she said, yes, in his bedside cabinet. And well, could you pop them in his po po coat pocket? Don't tell him. And let's see what will happen. So he came to my shoot, wow. and I brought my black raincoat with me. And and so so we, we done the shoot, and it's always it's always fun and engaging, and and it, he is as amazing as you want him to be. He's he's a beautiful man. At the very end of the shoot, I said, Michael, how about we one last go giving it the the, the Michael K. David Bailey homage? He went, Andy, tell you what, if we ever have the glasses, we'll do it. Ah, <laughs> check wow. your pockets. 
<laughs> and, and, and literally that's so, so, and uh, we've done about five six shots four of them was laughing because he thought it was such a funny thing to do yes and then this and then the one where he's doing the actual serious face is um the one i framed amazing and the k-moss story is it did you're friendly with her would you just like the photograph or is there something more to it yeah yeah so um i've known kate for a long while i'll, I'll, I'll buy um um Vivian Westwood because right. I, I did this campaign for Vivian Westwood uh 2012 roughly yep. uh, called Send the Arctic mm -hmm. where she had lots of famous people wearing her branded t-shirt and I met Kate then and we got on really well because my sheets are quite unique I have no assistants I've got no hair no makeup it's Andy in a camera and so people like Kate is, is photographed and a thousand times expect an entourage of you know stylists and assistants mm. and it was just me and i explained to her actually kate after the photo i will edit the picture when i could click that will be the final shot it, it's that. not yeah it's not it's not how clever i am in photoshop it's it's what magic we can make when i go click so good man i i, I mean i've done these pictures and then I done the contact sheet of these pictures and I sent them and she phoned me up a bit tearful. Uh, this is exactly how my daughter sees me. And uh, it's quite a beautiful thing to wow. say. And, wow. and, and, and so this picture is one of the only unedited photographs of Kate. And, 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 and luckily, luckily for me, she loves it. So that's, it's amazing actually, because um, do you know what this ties, this is not, why this convention came about funnily enough it ties in quite nicely and then i do want to understand your story a little bit but whilst we're at this point i, I said this to someone the other day or i was thinking about this i kind of like thinking about what where society is and what's going on and things and <clears throat> i had this concept of like james bond right and, and again it's not related to the photographs you took it's just complete coincidence funnily enough but i said this right you know if you went to 20 years ago not how many years ago like the Pierce brosnan films were right let's say it was 20 years ago and you went and saw the film and you saw Pierce brosnan who's probably better looking than everyone that's watching the film he's uh the girl he's with probably hotter than the girl that you're with the car he's driving is probably better than the car you're driving the job he's got etc 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 but you don't come away from that like um, microcosm entertainment of two hours or whatever going, wow, my car I'm going back to is really crap or that you just don't. You appreciate that's for entertainment. However, I feel like what's happened here on social media, particularly Instagram, is we don't do that anymore. We don't realize it's for entertainment, that it's for someone's perfect photograph that's posed in a certain way and all the rest of it. And we are doing the equivalent of watching a James Bond film going, oh, but I sit in office. I'm not an international espionage. I'm not in, you know, do you know what? I know it sounds silly, but that's kind of what it is. That's kind of what's happening. I just thought I'd bring it up because you're a, and I I'm, I love Instagram, but I'm always, when I do my stories, it's like the, whatever I'm doing, like it's unedited. Like there's no, I get a perfect filter. Like I, I love that side of stuff. And maybe that's what resonates with me. I don't know. I mean, I had this conversation a few years ago because when, it turned to my 30th year of doing this, so we talked about four years ago. Um, so, so someone asked me, you know, um, because I've been doing it for so long, I, 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 and in the first few years, I was lucky enough to shoot some old Hollywood, someone that, you know, like a Rod Steigers and, and uh, Sidney Poitier and a uh, Paul I'll Newton. be honest, I'm 30 years old, so I'm struggling with some of these names, and I, I probably should know who they oh, are, but I don't. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 all those Oscar winners, they're all Oscar winners, wow. and um, uh, and I was so lucky to, to have met them uh, mm -hmm. because I was on the cusp of them, you know, that was still alive. And I was asked in this interview, um, will there ever be another Hollywood icon? Mm. And Honestly, I don't think there will be. And, and, and the rationale I bring to it is in like the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, early 80s, there was an audience. People enjoyed to be an audience. They enjoyed looking at famous people. Mm. Nowadays, more people want to be famous. So there's less of an audience. Wow. So, 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 so like Instagram, or oh, anyone who's got a, 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 a camera is now a photographer. Uh, they can now 
do, do it, but it was actually, um, this iPhone I've got, the new iPhone, mm. is more powerful than a camera I had five years ago. The, the pixels is really? better quality. And um, so anyone can be a photographer. And, and because of social media, anyone can be famous. Anyone can speak to a famous person. They can DM a famous person. Whereas 20 years ago, if you want to, to speak or, or reach out to a famous person, it what what your agent, what your manager, what your publicist. Now you can speak. Well, it's, it's it's even this very conversation, right? That like for me to fuck get to you 20 years ago, 10 years ago, like, all right, it's possible, but like Zoom wasn't really where it's at, and like it would be grainy and like to you know what I mean? It wouldn't, it just wouldn't be as, as which is a good a good thing and a, and a bad thing in, in in equal measure. There's pros and cons to that. But I want to I want to go back to you because that's more important in my opinion. And um, I t- I said to you at the beginning, and I always repeat this, but the Steve Jobs quote of "You can't connect got dots going forwards only backwards," right? So like, when were you the the kid that when whatever cameras were around back in your day was just fascinated by the family photo. Back I don't know what <laughs> I don't know when that day you've been doing this for 30 years. It must be so a bit of time ago. You look super young. I don't know how you you. I kept... am super young. No, I mean, I mean, my story is, is, is I, I, my entire path has been wrong. Um, <laughs> I went to a very um, uh, old-fashioned school. It's a, a Victorian school. Okay, uh, and the ethics were very Victorian. And so in 1982, 83, uh, when I left school, they get you on the stage one at a time. Headmaster shakes your hand, say, okay, what do you want to be? You say, I want to be A, and then everyone, and, mm. and off you go. Mm. And it was my turn. What I said, okay, Gots, what do you want to be? I want to be a photographer. He laughed, everyone laughed. He said, no, there's no career in photography. I said, what do you mean, sir? He said, there's no career. You need a proper job. He said, you should be a chef. So he enrolled me into the local catering school. Yes. And so for two years, I I, I was I, I became a chef. And, and I was, and then I was qualified as, as a head chef. I got my wow. 761, 762. So I was a qualified head chef. And, and I was serving uh, for all that next year. Really unhappy. I did not enjoy chefing at all. And it got to September, uh, and it started being a bit autumnal and a bit wintry. And one day there was two covers in, and the waitress was snowed in, so I had to cook and serve. Mm-hmm. And so I was serving this guy and his wife. He said, "You don't look very happy at all." I said, "I'm really not. I don't, I don't like my, my my career." He said, "He said, what do you want to do?" I said, "I want to be a photographer." The guy said, "I teach photography." at a school in Holt. You're the same age as my pupils. You want to come hobbies morning, every Saturday, come with them, I'll teach you with my students. And I did, for six months, I wow. went on hobbies morning. He taught me lighting, darkroom work, the fundamentals of photography. That following year, the very, very, very first BTEC in design photography was launched. They wanted 15 people throughout the UK to guinea pig the course. This guy wrote a letter, the Dean of Arts said, got this guy here, no arts whatsoever, but he's got a something. On the strength of that letter, wow. they took this course, and, then, and it was a two-year course. Wow. He won, it, it was called a BTEC National Diploma in Design and Photography. Okay. And in year one, you do fashion, food, landscape, still alive, product shots, everything. Year two, you specialise in a something for an entire year. Hmm. It's got to the end of year one, there was nothing that really done it for me. It's all nice. Yeah. Uh, landscapes are nice. Um, but there's nothing. And I was this far to give it up. And this was in 1980, uh, 1990. 1990. Right. right. And Stephen Fry came to my college. It was his Stephen. Stephen Fry, Norfolk. He was living in South Wooten, and he came to the college to hand out the diplomas and do an AIDS talk because the 80s, 90s, that's when the big mm-hmm. AIDS things was. And so um, I knew where his Q&A would be. So the room next door in the arts block, I put up a backdrop, a light, a camera, which is Q&A. 
listen to for an hour rabbiting on. Then I put my hand up, get the boy at the back, uh, Mr. Fry, can I do a picture of you next door, please? Uh, will you be quick? I, I promise I will. I did 10 shots in 90 seconds, changed my life. That eureka, that boom, that hits you. Uh, because I, I was able to think, well, maybe you won't because you're so young, but back in <laughs> 1990, <laughs> there was only four TV channels. There wasn't Sky, there wasn't Cable. Yeah. There was BBC One, BBC Two, ITV Channel Four. Stephen was doing Blackadder, Jeeves and Worcester, Brian Laurie. He's getting 25 million viewers per show. He's a mega wow. star back wow. then. So getting him to be a bit of a fool for me for 10 shots, it was this literally... Wow. A, and an adrenaline armful of something and, and, and the quirky twist of fate was he loved the picture because it, I wasn't being clever. It was a fluke of luck. A shadow hit his nose there. He's got a big break in his nose. A shadow hit the break. He thought it was, it, I was a lighting genius. He went, oh, I love the picture. Can you do me a 10 by eight? And of course I will. Then I'm 10 by eight. He put it on his mantelpiece. That Sunday, Kenneth Branner came around for Sunday lunch. He said, who, do, who's, who's, who's that love? He went, oh, it's a student. Uh, it's, do you have his number? So Kenneth Branner phoned me. And he said, can you come to Highgate and shoot me and my wife, Emma Thompson? And literally that's how my career started. Wow. See, that, see, for me, there's like quite a bit to unpack there that I think maybe, and when I say this generation, like I don't even mean mine necessarily. Maybe, I don't think it matters what age, right? But like, I don't think people realize that it's often these like, just taking the opportunity. Like, like you put your hand up and ask for a photograph, you'd set it up. Like for some reason, like you just thought, I'm going to go do this. Most people think to do that, but don't actually act upon it and, and do anything about it, right? And then obviously there's different things that lead towards you getting to where you got to. But I think in every, almost everyone that I've spoken to in different walks of life that is that has been successful or gone down some sort of endeavor, like there's always those moments, right? That like are just chance or fluke, but you still had to make it happen, right? You still had to have a, the, you put your hand up, you still had to know where his Q&A was, had to have the room set up, et cetera, et cetera, and then execute over the years really good photography because you were crap, I'm pretty sure your career wouldn't have existed, right? So, um, I I love that, uh, that that golfer, Gary Palmer. Yeah. He had, a, he had a great quote where he did a hole in one and someone from, from the tee shouted, you're lucky, Gary. He said, yeah, the, the, the harder I practice, the luckier I get. Yes. Absolutely. And, and I with, so someone said to me, how do I get the famous people? How originally do you get famous people? And I said, well, my job is, is like telesales. If you make 10 phone calls a day, you get 10 no's. You even get 100 in a day, you might get one. So it's like constant. You need to be constantly pushing yourself in all areas. And maybe, maybe one day, a bit of luck will happen. So, so that's quite really quite interesting because I think people are doing a tendency just to give up on whatever it is they're trying to do super easily. Because I, I I read something or saw something looking for your Instagram, uh, a post that you put out, um, which again like super. This was after I you know we had the interview scheduled when I was looking into yourself, and it's a post you put out on the twenty first of September last year. Do you remember what that was? Was it my letters? Yep. Yeah. 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 So, so literally, when I first started, um, I knew I wanted to do famous people. I knew I wanted to do actors. I knew this. So uh, that literally early... was that that literally based on the Stephen Fry experience. Prior to that, that wasn't even like I have no. I, I kind of like photography, but I don't know what area or was it. I don't think photography is my thing. What was the actual thought at that point? It, it was once I had someone that was in my house three times every week in front of me live, and I was making him be silly. I was making him pull face. Was, so that when I had that power, that well, if I can do it with him, I'm going to do it with other famous people. And I think it was, I think it was, a, it was Stephen Fry that planted that seed. And I, I, and what I did was I went to my local library, and they still do it now. There's a collection of books called Spotlights, mm -hmm. and it lists 
uh, it has it's a picture of every actor, and then the contact details of so the agent. And so I went to my library, I got out all the spotlights, A to Z, and I wrote 300 letters to 300 actors who, who I recognised. But this literally and, straight after Stephen Fry, pretty yeah. much in that period. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, I, just, I just wanted, because having no agent or no manager or no one to push me, I had no idea how you approach famous people. So I thought I'll just write them a letter saying, hi, I've just left college, I want to do famous people, can I photograph you please, yep. basically. And so I wrote 300 letters. And then all the no letters started coming back. And literally it was years. And uh, uh, literally, uh, it, Christopher Lee wrote the best one. It was just, thank you, but no. That was it, that, that was his, that's his entire answer. Uh, and and, it's, uh, and it's, it's kind of, the passion you have when you want to do something, after so long, it does kind of, it's sort of blue deflating. There's a little bit of air in there, but not as much as there was, you know? And, uh, sure. and, and then, then from nowhere, one day, my house phone rang. It was actor Joss Ackland, who actually died two weeks ago. It was very sad, because he was a beautiful man. Um, he phoned, he'd just done the movie, Lethal Weapon, with Mel Gibson, playing the baddie. He's always, he's always a baddie, Joss was. And he said, Andy, I hate being photographed. But my son needs some wedding photographs done. If you come down to Clavelli in Devon, photograph my son's wedding, I'll give you half an hour afterwards. And I thought, what do I have to lose? Wow, that's awesome. So, 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 so it was a six hour drive from Norfolk to Clavelli. And I got there and uh, his wife was alive at the time. And, and, and we had a bit of a chat and uh, she said, so, you are staying tonight, aren't you? I said, well, I don't have any plans here. I thought I'd just do the shoot, do Joss, and then nip off. I said, no, you can stay. Uh, we've got a spare bedroom. So um, I've done the wedding. I did these pictures of Joss, who's a bit tipsy, so they made them into great pictures. <laughs> and then, then, then the next morning, um, over breakfast, his family had, had went then. And he said, so um, I was in receipt of your letter asking to be shot by you. I said, yes, Joss, I wrote 300, and you're the only one that said yes. He said, I'll tell you why. I was like, okay. He said, there's no meaning to the letter. You didn't ask anything. Uh, you, didn't, you didn't plant a seed of why I should do it. Uh, so she, he said, you know, if you'd have come with a project idea, say, I want to photograph because I want to do this, mm. he said, I bet you at least a half people said yes. I said, okay, Joss, give me an idea for a book. He went, hmm. What do you do? Who shagged who? And I said, I don't, I don't think many people will, will, will. But at that time, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon was going around. So I said, Well, how about we do the who knows who? So who's best friends of? And it's just to all famous people. So I said, Okay, just name me one of your famous friends who's an actor or singer. He went, Well, I've just done a movie called What Mischief with Greta Skaki. Got on really, really well. And I said, well, can you, can you phone her for me? So he phoned her there and then, and I'm going to photo shoot. And that was the start of, of an idea for a book. And then went to Greta's house, did the same thing. Who's your best friend? Who's someone, who's someone you really admire? She said, okay, um, I, I like Alan Bates. So she got Alan Bates. And, and then, then literally, I went around for about five years, photographing literally every British actor. Uh, everyone from John Hurt to Michael Gambon to uh, Kenneth Branagh again to uh, literally a who's who of British actors went round and around the UK. And some people were nominated more than once. So I eventually got back to Kenneth Branagh again for the third time. And, and he, said, he, said, he said, darling, when you come, bring your book with, it, with you so I'll, I'll see you know, what you've done in the last five years. And he was kind of leafing through them. But not many Yanks here, are there? I said, no. I said, no, I'm just from the UK. He said, well, don't you want any Americans? I said, I said, of course I'd love one. I mean, if, if you know someone. He said, well, I've just signed with a new agent in New York. She reps uh, Kevin Klein, who's just won the Oscar for Fish Called Wanda. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, if you can, is it okay? Um, you know, stay by your phone because if Kevin wants to do it, he'll. It, it's all these people to say yes straight away and he'll phone you straight away. So 
Within 10 minutes, the phone was ringing. It was Kevin Klein. And he was, he ah, oh, I've heard about you. Um, I'm in New York. I'm doing the New York Public Theatre Play in the Park. Uh, we rehearse every lunchtime. If you're ever in New York over the next eight weeks, pop in. I said, you name a day and I'll book a flight specifically. Well, on another Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday at one o'clock. Uh, and and so, so I said, done. So I literally flew over wow. uh, to, to, to their rehearsal room. And it was during lunch break. And he was the sweetest, loveliest guy. And he came in, band full of energy, and we done the pitches and gone really, really well. And he said, so um, whilst you're in town, what, what, what plans do you have? I said, well, nothing, Kevin. I'm flying home tomorrow evening. Like, oh, you, you came just to shoot me? I said, yeah. He said, well, what are you doing tomorrow lunchtime? I said, nothing specific, because I'll, I'll be packing to, to fly home. He said, well, can you be back here the same time tomorrow? I said, okay. I thought no more of it. That evening, we went out to Times Square, to the Irish bars, got a bit tipsy, went to the hotel. Next morning, packed my case. And I checked out the hotel. And I, I, the idea was going from my hotel to the theatre, theatre to the um, airport. Yep. So I got, so I got back, back to the rehearsal room with my, with my bags, set up again, one o'clock. A very excited Kevin come dancing in. He said, okay, how many roles of film do you have? Like, 10? So, do you promise you'll be really, really quick? I said, yeah. He said, it's their lunch hour. Be quick. And he was really, really happy. And what he'd done, he's got the entire cast of the play lined up outside the door, like naughty school children. <laughs> First one come in, Mel Street. No way. Second one, Christopher Walken. Third one, Steve Buscemi. John Goodman, Natalie Portman. There's an entire cast of, 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 um, of the Seagull came in wow. one after another. And, and, and so, so I did she done 10 household Hollywood names in literally eight minutes. Jeez. And it's moments like this, these and these moments in my career have happened a lot. People have gone out of their way to help. They don't have to, they don't need to, because they don't need any more pats on the back or accolades. They just do it because they want to help. And mm. that's happened so many times in these 34 years. So I feel, on the product of luck rather than talent. See, I, I definitely I see where, where you're coming from, but at the same time, and from what I've read also, how your technique and what you've kind of alluded to of being friendly with the person you're shooting, talking with them conversationally. And then I think I, I read somewhere, which I quite liked, um, where it's a lovely conversation interrupted by the occasional click. Yeah. And and, I, and 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 then you know and the fact that you you are one man on the camera and it's not the whole pomp and circumstance that, that these people are all used to, I think that yeah. you probably don't realize, but that's more probably the reason that you've got these opportunities because the person that you've shot and you and and, and still you've still had to drive six hours for the first actor and then continue for years and years, right? That's not luck. That's like yeah. determination. That's like great as you said like your passion just just dwindles 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 because i'm pretty certain that over that period you weren't making a living particularly well out of doing that you were doing that as a passion project is that kind of true yeah absolutely yeah i mean yeah. i'd say the first nine ten years of my career you know it, it, it i mean it wasn't driving around in fancy cars and, and, eat, and eating fancy food or drinking champagne all the time it's it's you know literally you, you're wondering where the next pounds and come from yeah. because, because I mean I, sometimes I had to help my career by doing a second job uh, and, and, and you know just to pay the bills and you have to but if you've got the idea of I, was, I know so many famous actors now who had to work being a waiter or a chef or uh, or a doorman or a, 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 a clerk just to, just to pay the bills, to be able to pay for the acting lessons, pay for singing lessons, pay because they, they could see their goal, they had a dream, and they could see the only way they can facilitate their dream 
is to um, find a way of doing it. But I would just say, talking about my photo shoots, I do say my photo shoots are 70% luck, 20% alcohol, and 10% uh, talent. Uh, because because I, 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 I do think any photographer, any photographer, I'd say 70% is luck. Whether you're a landscape photographer and a cloud go across at the right moment, or you're a street photographer or you're a fashion photographer, someone spins at that moment and the material goes in the air, it's luck. You, you, there, there's certain things you cannot plan. Sure. And for, unless, unless you're photographing a bowl of fruit that <laughs> isn't going to move, a lot of it is luck. Uh, and obviously, you, you can manipulate a, a, a something to, I mean, I'll give you a perfect example of my photography and, and luck and cleverness. Okay. I was shooting the actor, uh, Andrew Scott, okay. who's this, this phenomenal actor. And we done the, the normal heroic looking ones and the grumpy ones and the silly ones, all, all, all my little scenarios I do. And then we just started talking at the very end, just, just, as I was gonna pack up, we are just talking. And I said, so Andrew, so how good an actor are you? Well, I'm not bad, I suppose. I said, well, are you the kind of actor who needs a tear stick or can you cry on command? He said, well, I, 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 can, I can do it, I can cry. Then he kind of went a bit, bit pale. He said, you're not going to ask me to do it. I said, of course I am. <laughs> and, 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 and so, he, so he said, get your camera ready. And he looked at his toes. He said, three, two, one, looked up. As he looked up, a tear ran down his eyes. Wow. And, I took, and I took one photograph as the tear was halfway down his cheek. And it was one shot. And that is such a powerful shot. I mean, in my portfolio, generally, it's one really powerful shot. Because the anguish in his eyes and then the lone tear. But if I hadn't lost him, if I hadn't crafted that moment, because I didn't go to the mm -hmm. shoot, I didn't go there thinking, oh, I'm going to have a crying shot. You know, I mean, whenever I do a shoot, I go there with an idea. An yeah. idea. I'd say 99% of the time, something better happens. Yeah. Something unplanned, something... Absolutely. That, uh... Well, it, but, it, but it's like in my universe. So I'm a, I'm a watch dealer. And um, I, met, I was doing a deal over in Zurich earlier in the year. At the reception, I met a guy who had a nice watch, nothing expensive, just I'm a watch collector. If I see something nice, I'll just have a conversation. That's turned into an actual sale that now I'm flying out to Vienna to go deliver the watch uh, next few days. And then he's gone and said, oh, there's a friend of mine that I want you to meet who's a really big collector who collects, you know, £100,000 plus watches. And oh, by the way, I also want to buy a thirty thousand pound watch for you next year. And I don't even care what the price is because I want to go through you. It's the same thing, right? That is fluke in some regard, and there's a lot of luck associated to that. But I've also crafted the moment as you have. So, like, yes, you know, of that whole create your own look. There are elements of what I do where you just a chance meeting and this happened, that happened. But how many times does something not happen, right? Do you know what I mean? So, like it's not really luck because actually there's so many things where nothing happened. You already talk about the one where it did happen, but how many conversations have I had with people where they said they're going to do this and other buy a watch or do what have you, nothing happens. And how many shots have you tr like, not the things quite happened or you didn't get through to the person. Like, you know what I mean? Most people, that's the story. They don't have the next part of it where that bit of luck is kind of somewhere found along the line. And the only thing that can be said between that is persevering and, and determination, you know, and keeping going for such a long period of time. Because most people after nine weeks these days, maybe nine days or nine hours or nine minutes, decide actually that thing's too much hard work to go after that dream, whatever that might be. But you spent nine years following something. I saw a TV show a couple of years ago with Devin Brown. And he showed and, and uh, he showed this bit of unedited video. He got a 50p piece mm -hmm. and he flicked it into a, a bowl mm -hmm. 50 times, and each time it ended up heads. And, 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 and so behind him it said, I'm going to do 50 heads. And it's and he, and he did it live. And he, and he said, if you're gonna figure out how I've done this, you will have the key to life. And what he'd done was he'd done it about, about 7,000 times. And this happened in pure luck, 
50 times in a row it happened, added 7,000 times. But it's like that famous saying about Edison. Yeah. And, 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 and making a light bulb. He had 999 failures yeah. before he when it worked. So he could have given up. Absolutely. And like, listen, if the first thing you do gets you to a light bulb, right, or whatever, all right, fair play. But like, and there is element, there's always element of luck and chance and, and, and walking past someone in the street and that turning into, or like yourself in that restaurant with a fellow who off to the course. But at the same time, you still had to explain to that person, here's what I want to do, here's what I'm trying to achieve. You could have just said, yeah, I'm not that happy and walked off, you know? Yeah. But like at all these different times, you, you have pushed the envelope to go after what it is, whether it's a six hour drive, to, 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 to photograph for the wedding, whether it's flying out to New York on a whim, you know, like that's the difference. What I find, and that, that, that's that's what I love is that I, I see the, the photographs and, and I have no idea where this conversation is going to go. I have no idea if you're going to even respond to the email or even if the email address is just an info that no one ever looks at. But like by just shooting the shot, which is exactly what I did and going, what's the worst that happened? It takes me 30 seconds to write an email. Yeah. Um, and ironically, I didn't know all this. You've, you, we are very aligned in, in lots of things, the rejection letters. And your story is one of almost every entrepreneur could tell you the same thing or actor or successful person or whatever. And I'm sure with all the conversations you've had, you and, and the people that you've met, the stories that you've you've heard of how people have got roles. And, you know, a lot of the most successful films come out, out of the most bizarre circumstances and people weren't supposed to get the role and they did get the role because someone was ill that day you know all these things but you still got to make yourself available you know what i mean and uh i, I shot uh this actor uh it's uh, 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 past now okay. um it's called um alan alder and uh um he's, he's been around for, for years i mean uh catch 22 was was one of his Big roles, but then he won the Oscar for Little Miss Sunshine, and he's this, this old board actor. And Clooney had cast him in Ocean's Eleven to, to play the old guy Saul. Ah, and, 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 and so he's meant to be the, the, the old the old guy, you know. And a week before filming, he got he got massive diarrhea issues, and he couldn't film. So they had to find an actor who looked like Alan Alder. So they found Carl Rayner, who looked similar. And that's how Carl got the part, uh, because he looked like Alan Alder, and 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 and, and both Alan and Carl laugh about it because you know, you know uh, uh, Carl said if I was more handsome, I'd have never got the part, and 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 you know, and, and so and little things like that. And you're right, there's so many actors who've got roles, got parts um, when they shouldn't have, and uh, it's it's kind of made them household names. Yeah, I, I'm 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 just. Uh... It's it's fascinating to me, as I say, going back to the same theme, but how you like, I think a lot of people will look at the people you photograph and where you're at and think, um, the as you mentioned yourself, the path that you probably follow is probably more whatever traditional or linear looks like. And I haven't met anybody with a traditional linear path. I don't think it exists. There are people with a more kind of, uh, normal quote unquote path, but more often than not, that doesn't lead to extraordinary results, right? That level of, you know, entrepreneurship or um, enthusiasm or individuality or like really pushing for something like doesn't normally come from a very linear career. As much as there's nothing wrong with that, that doesn't yeah. lead to extraordinary results like you've achieved. No, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd say um, my thing was I've always had belief one day, no matter how long it would take, one day, right down the, right down that some, one day, I'm going to get where I want to be one day. And it was that belief. And it's like the day I, I would ever doubt I'd get there, I'd have given up. The fact is, my, my family, my parents, everyone said, you know, You've given it a good shot. You've tried that's your best. What, that's what I was just going to get to. I was really interested to understand where your people around you were at this point, because that's what you hear on most people again. 
They yeah, one point, yeah. some point, they go, "Come on, now you got to be do something serious." Like, yeah, my, 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 my parents were absolutely go back to to, to cooking. Everyone needs to eat, you wow. know the, the, that mentality. So and, and, you know, and and they were right. They absolutely were right. I mean, both my parents are past now, but they were absolutely right. You know, um, if I felt you have gut instinct in you, and yes. there were some actors who know. One day they're going to be on that stage. One day they're going to they're going to be on the screen. Some actors who are, who are friends of mine don't have that. They think you know I can't see myself ever winning at anything. And I would question maybe is that the right job for you then? If you can't see yourself, it's like anyone who who wants to be a horse rider, even before they get on a horse, can see themselves on a horse. Yes. Anyone who was, my dad couldn't swim, but he but he could see himself one day. He could see himself one day. He, he, he would swim one day, but he had that vision. He one day, and I had the vision one day. I get famous people in front of me acting like idiots. I knew it. I knew one day I get famous people acting a fool for me because no one was doing it. You, whenever you you see, but it was going back to the eighties, uh, early nineties, whenever you saw a Vanity Fair or both or GQ cover, they're always quite iconic, yes. moody, or, or, um, they, they had, they've had the hair done, the makeup done, yes. they, they've got a bold suit on, they, 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 you know, and they're very stylized. Nothing human. There's nothing wow. human about them. Wow. They're like mannequins. And I was thinking, but I want to know what Harrison Ford's like when his Harrison Ford sat, sat on the toilet. I mean, I mean what, what is this guy like? What, what is he? What, 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 what makes him human? And, right. and it's not sitting there in like a bow tie and a white shirt, uh, smouldering. That's not Harrison Ford. And, and and when I shot him, I said to him, Mr. Ford, what does everyone think you're an arsehole for? And and he said, well, I get bored in interviews. I was, I was okay. He said, everyone wants to speak about Star Wars. I said, I, 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 actually, I can see that. And he said, he said, look, he said, Google any interview with me. And see, as soon as Star Wars pops up, look at my eyes. And yeah. they do, they glaze over it's, as soon as know, Star Wars. It's it's interesting because I am not compared to Harrison Ford before this gets, gets to that point. But I was on the BBC's Apprentice, right, in 2017. And I always, always say this because at that point in time, 7 million people a week are watching you, right? So it's one in 10 in the UK and it's, it's a lot. People come every single day and they'd ask the same questions, right? The same questions, same questions, same questions. And I remember like just that feeling of, I want to have FAQs that I can just give to you. Like, can you not just, if you're going to ask me something, you can ask them, but like be human, right? Ask something of thought. And when I always say this to people, if you meet someone that's famous or in the public eye or someone that you've looked up to or something, I said, don't ask them the FAQs. Don't meet David Beckham and go, what's it like playing for England or Manchester United? But if you ask David Beckham, similarly to the Harrison Ford situation, if you were to ask him something like, how was it bringing up children in, in Spain, in France, in England versus America? What was that like? All of a sudden, he's actually thinking. He's not just like, you know, I'm David Beckham. Yeah, he's great playing for United. Thanks. Yeah. You know what I mean? You can You can throw that question in at some point, but like, build a touch of rapport with something of thought and not just a fanboy question, you know? And I think that's the same with this Harrison Ford saying. I've seen it myself, like, happen. Yeah, but because I knew Harrison was really into vintage aircraft and war and stuff. And actually, as soon as he came in, I was talking about Duxford. It was, it was the anniversary of the Battle of Britain. I was just talking about you know, war and, and aeroplanes. And you could see... They were relieved. You see him relax. Absolutely. You see, you see him. And so when at the end of the shoot, I said, do you want to do some silly ones? And he said, no one ever asked me. No one ever asked me to mess around because they, they think I'm an arsehole. And, and, and I, I said, well, let's do some. And he said, in 35 years, I've never done this before. And I've got this amazing shot of him being quirky and silly. And uh, I'm lucky but that, that I've got... I, I, I think it's because when I shoot, there's no one else there. There's no, there's no one looking over my shoulder. Because if I was shooting at Harrison, for example, and there was two or three assistants staring at him, he'd be self-conscious. He wouldn't want to be a bit silly or quirky. Mm. But because it's just me there, 
who, who've been speaking to them for an hour or so and just chatting, they're more happy to, to lighten up and, and be themselves. And I think a lot of these people want to be seen as a human, not an actor or a singer. They want to be seen that actually, you know, I've got kids and I've got, I've got a partner. I, I, I'm, I'm a real person. I love to be silly now and again. I love to be serious now and again. But sometimes they don't have the option to be silly. And that's what I try and give them. I say, you know, okay, be a schoolboy for 20 minutes and, and give them the option to, to okay, okay, be zany. And, and people love that. They're going to unleash themselves. Awesome. Just going back to the, what we raised before about people around you saying, you know, come on, Andy, like, let's do, do something, like, do a real job now tactic. Um, two questions on that. At what point did you feel that now I've, quote unquote made it and what what was it why was it was it when you all of a sudden were financially able to do things was it when you photographed a number of people and you weren't getting as many rejections like what was it for you where you went oh shit that thing was that little bit of light I'm actually now there or whatever thereabouts or much closer to being a photographer whatever that means I'd say there's been a couple of moments I mean when I was eight okay I went to a wedding it's family's wedding, and you, you get these little name tags, mm. uh, uh, little table placings, mm. and Andy Dots on. He's got a pen of a doctor and an MBE. After a doctor and an no MBE. No way. And then one day, when I got the doctor and he got MBE, I thought then, okay, wow. that's, that, that's, that, that's okay. You didn't keep that table place thing, did you? I, I'm pretty sure my mum did. Wow. I, I think it's been, but, but, that's but, incredible. But I, I thought I always thought one day I'll be a doctor and an MBA. Where, I, I, where does that like? Where does that come from? Like, where where does that vision of? Because at that point you didn't know you're going to be a photographer, right? Yeah, that wasn't on the agenda. So what was the yeah. doctor of? Like, what what was exactly? Was I, at, at, at the time, I had no idea. I'm, I'm, I'm from a very, a very let, let's say modest family. Okay. My dad, my, my dad was a milkman. Okay. And and my mum was a waitress until she retires. Wow. And and and, and uh, n- none of my entire family. We're talking aunts, uncles, cousins. No one went to university. So I'm from a farming district in Norfolk. Okay. So they're either farmers or worked at, worked at local shops or okay. did some manual labour. And I knew, and they all speak with a, with a very very pronounced Norfolk accent, uh, which I had. And then one day, I thought, I'm not going to get far in life with a Norfolk accent. So I trained myself to not speak Norfolk. I lost it when I was about 10 or 11. I, 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 I can actually remember speaking to myself in my bedroom, trying to lose the accent, you know, when I was about 10. Because, because I, at that point, you wanted to progress somewhere, and you thought you needed to do that to progress somewhere. I want, I want, I want to do something outside of my town. I want to do something that wasn't... Right involved working at the local petrol station or being a milkman or and, and there's nothing did you, have, being a did you have people like i'm trying to understand at that point right like what era is this where are, what is this nine this uh, early 80s early 80s, early 80s. Early 80s. like so it wasn't social media obviously at that point it wasn't what was it that you thought there's more to whatever this is than just my local village, right? Like, what did you, you must have seen something or magazines, was it? Like, was it, were you interested in celebrities at the time or something or TV or? I was a movie buff. I've always been a movie buff. Ah, I've always okay. loved movies. Always enjoyed movies. Always, always, always. Right. Um, uh, thinking, I, I know no one and my circle, my town, even North Norfolk generally, no one was famous and pop of Nelson. Uh, there was no one from Norfolk, no one, and, and and it was like you know, how do you progress? What do you need to do? There's no one who spoke like me on television or on the radio, uh, and and so I, I thought, well, if just small steps, first to get rid of the accent, somehow, don't know how. Obviously, in my head. How do you get rid of an accent? What do you do to, and, and literally, it's literally, you watch old 1940s movies where everyone's like very, very, very darling. And you watch old movies and try, try to mimic and try, try to shorten your vowels and try to try to speak properly. 
I then did. I, I'm now kind of reversing it back a little bit to Norfolk again now. I mean, because I don't need to have, have the uh, So I, I, I'm lazy now. I'm going to go back to, back to Norfolk a little bit. Um, but I can remember when my nan was alive and she used to say to me, say 33. But you, you say it so poshly. And, and, it's, 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 it was, and my family were picking up that I was trying to change. And then when I said to my parents, uh, okay, I want to go to university, um, absolutely supportive. And they couldn't afford it to send me. I had to work and, and, and send myself. Um, and, 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 and so I did have to get jobs to fund my university. Um, but I knew there was going to be a path where I went from college to university to get a job. And, and that was the path. Obviously, nowadays, people have bypassed that. But back then, my only understanding was, OK, to get where you wanted to do on a ladder, you start school, college, university, proper job, proper job. Mm -hmm. That's what the, and so that's what, no one in my family had done that. So I was the first to go up that little ladder. And, wow. and, and, and um, then, then, then when I got to university, and it wasn't what I thought it would be, the day I left, so the other day, a university lecturer emailed me, said, well, will you come in and talk to my students? I said, of course I will. I'd love to go speak to them. I said, but I will tell them they don't need education. You do, you do, you do, I'll, I'll tell them that. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, I went to university and because I wasn't a fine artist, because I was a landscape photographer, I was doing it all wrong. I, wasn't, I, 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 was, I, I was doing everything wrong. And, and uh, I don't understand how art can be right or wrong. If, if, if in my head, if I want to shoot the back of somebody's head out of focus, on the tilt, if that's what I want to do, how could any lecturer say that's wrong? Uh, and, and, and they said, well, I can see your point. And he said, I can actually see your point. And I said, well, I have to come in and tell your kids, you know, you know, this is how I did it. This is my progression. Yes. But you don't, I, the day I left university, I binned my portfolio. But I knew I would not get a job from my portfolio. So I just threw it away. Uh, and, and, and literally, and then the, literally the day after I left university, I started building my portfolio that I would then use to get my first job. It is fascinating. Your story is like so fascinating. And, and one of the, also one of the things that I don't think people do enough, and of course this is a thread throughout your, your career, and I think how you've got some of the shots that you've got, is just having the conversation with a, another human being and understanding and actually giving a shit to pardon the threat of why and how that person's come to what they've got they've come to. Um, because they, I, th I always believe no matter who you are, and of course you're hyper successful in your field, anyone, anywhere has got things that they've overcome or, you know, um, interesting intricacies that to them are just like to you doing at 10 years old of learning to talk in a different accent it's just like that's just what i did but to most of the people that's like <clears throat> at 10 years old most people aren't thinking anything to do with the fact of what how they need to position themselves shall we say for something later on right so that is pretty pretty rare and unique but i'm sure to you it's just like that's just just what i did interestingly yeah. the, i know you see the parents have passed unfortunately but People, other people around, so I presume you've got so your friends from back home or whomever, and 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 maybe that, that headmaster, maybe he's passed too, I don't know. Um, what what do they say? And, and and when did they start to go, shit, this guy's actually doing something pretty cool? I mean, I'd say over my 34-year career, it's only been the last probably eight years that I've let on to people what I do for a living. But normally I hide behind you know, only people in my hometown know my name. Um, and so when I go home, when I used to go home, I say, oh, um, what, what, what are you doing these days? Oh, I'm a photographer, weddings, you know, that, 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 in my hometown. Amazing. Whenever, whenever you say photographer, weddings, that's that's what people think. And, and, and so I say, yeah. So, so, so people, ah. it's, it's only since... Um, a few of my big big books have come out over the few, last few years. I've been on TV and, and newspaper. People then start, out of the blue, dropping me an Instagram post saying, ah, oh, uh, I've just seen you on the BBC News. I had no idea what you were doing. So nowadays, 
uh, I think people are happy that they know someone that's gone on to do something. Awesome. But I mean, no one, I, 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 there, were, there, were, there were people who do exactly what I do, exactly. There were a few people who started the same year I did, who choose to court the media, who do the red car, but they've got their own sky art shows. They, they do that kind of thing because they have a marketing platform behind them. And I just enjoy doing a job and then not doing a job and being Andy, watching, watching a film, you know, um, I, I'm not, and I, I love that. But I mean, going back to what you said earlier on about, see, when you do a, photo, a photo shoot with, with me, when any actor, and, and this is, so not singers so much, but actors, an actor wants the best. They want you to be the best you can be. And I find if an actor comes to me and the entire shoot is 100% them, the picture I'll get will be the same as every other picture they've taken. Mm. If on the other hand, it's all me, then every photograph I'll do will, 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 will look similar. So the perfect photo shoot is the actor give me 50%. I give fifty percent. Then in the middle, there's a little dance in the middle. Yes, and that's where the magic. Happens. It's but it's not all me, not all them. But we find this little um, significant juxtaposition in the middle. Yes, that we both feel relaxed, and we can just do a something. And that's and if I don't feel that at the end of a photo shoot, I feel something's gone wrong. I'll be I'll, well. Was I having an off day? Um, were they not up for it? And so I always question, if I don't feel, we had that little cha-cha-cha in the middle, I always mm. think, what's gone wrong? But luckily, um, I've shot, I, I think what's lovely is, I'm still friends with Stephen Fry now. So Stephen Fry, my first ever guy, we're still mates, so I, I, he emailed yesterday, actually. Um, okay. He, when I got to my anniversary year, 30 years, he wrote this piece for the magazine. And his QI elves then research into me. And the opening paragraph was Andy Gotts has shot more famous people than Annie Leibovitz, Lord Snowden, and David Bailey combined. I was, I've shot over 7,000 actors in my life. Jeez. And, and, and that's more than anyone else, any other photographer in history. That's so hey, I'm conscious of your time, which you it's I mean, this has been such a fascinating interview to, for me. Um I think one of the threads we talked about is the the tenacity, the having the dream, the ambition to do something and then putting things to practice. So if you're talking now to somebody, no matter what age they're at, right, and they're just in a position of discontentment of their, their career, where they're at with certain things, and they do have this like like somewhere you know from younger or something that they wanted to do or a passion or a project whatever like or, or, or maybe they're a younger person trying to figure out the way in this world like you've interviewed in your own way right when you're doing these photographs like as you say seven thousand people that um are of all different walks of life even though they do the similar thing what would you kind of advise people and how would you you know how would you help people or give people the little bit of what you've had to, to push forward and spend nine years doing what you're doing and then another nine years and then not until another eight years. I don't think many people realise that. Like it's not, you don't get there day one or day a hundred or day a thousand. Like I think it's, it's very interesting your story for sure. Um, I think I can't put it any better than the current guru of growing up. There, were, there was a prophet that was growing up called Rocky Balboa. And in Rocky One, he said this quote, and it is so poignant. It's not how hard you can hit, it's how hard you can be hit and get up. And I think, I think that says it all. It, you're, you're gonna have a life where you, it, it doesn't matter if you're an artist or an accountant or it doesn't matter, or a chef, it doesn't matter, you're, you're going to have your vision and it'll be knocked down, it'll be knocked down and you'll, and as long as you keep getting up, 
and plowing forward, going forward, keep that vision, you will eventually get to where you want to be. And so many people who I know who have made it have all said the same thing. It's, we've been around a long time. That's the key. Everyone who's famous has all has got a, a history of getting there. It's not boom, fame. It, it's, it's not that big brother, instantaneous fame. It's a slow progression, progression. And if you stick at something long enough, you will get to where you want to be. You will do. And it might not happen in the first year, the first two years, the first 10 years. It might not happen in the first few, but eventually, if you still go forward, you will get to where you want to be. And, you know, and I, I mean, Confucius said, you know, you are where you went, where you meant to be. So at this moment in time, you are exactly where you're meant to be. And, and your path could be going forward or going back, but you are exactly where you're meant to be at this moment in time. And I think if you build on that and keep aiming forward, it doesn't matter how many no's you get. It doesn't matter how many rejection letters. It doesn't matter how many people say you are doing it wrong. As long as you have the ability to believe in you and go forward, you will eventually get to where you want to be. It, interestingly enough, you, you've, uh, you've caught me personally at a very interesting in, in, impulse in my life, which is uh, everything's going great and yet I've still got this, I could do better thing. It's just always been in my brain. And I think... Um, just that longevity piece that you're talking about and everything you're saying, because listen, I'm, it's not for me to tell my story here. It's another, another time from another place, but that's, uh, it's simple, but coming from someone like you and hearing your story, it's far more impactful than just reading it on a, on a, on a movie quote or whatever, you know? Um, so I, I, listen, the fact that you give me an hour of your time, uh, I'm privileged. I really am. And, uh, uh, yeah, maybe, listen, I'm not an actor or celebrity at this point, but maybe one day we can do a photo shoot. That'd be really cool um, for some other projects that I've got. I don't know. Um, but I've, I've got no watch. <laughs> not yet. This, that's prime real estate, Andy. That is prime real estate. Um, but yeah, as I say, like, I don't know what else to say. It's been an absolute joy. And um, I think something people to understand from how this conversation came about, like, just try things, you know, speak, try speaking to that person that you admire or look at. And as I say, this came off the back of me just seeing some photographs of yours and a BBC article and going, wow, this guy, something about these photographs is great. I didn't know what it was. Like, I'm just like, this is great. Um, and reaching out to you. And uh, I'm going to have to get some of your books because uh, this, having spoken to you now, it makes complete sense why you're all at the top of your game, why your photographs just stood out in that brief, you know, the, 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 Attentions are fleeting now more and more. And the fact that you, I just saw this BBC article, I don't read really BBC all that much, and it just something, you know, stuck out. Um, that's a testament to the 34 years of work you've put in and more. Um, so, yeah, as I say, thank you very much. And I'm sure there's a lot of actors and other people who thank you too for for shooting them in, in ways that other people can't, <laughs> simply put. And I think you underestimate your ability and talent and you put too much down to look, but that's just my personal opinion on hearing your story. Someone said to me once, well, Andy, what is your best ability? And I said, my best ability is I can make people believe I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Maybe that's what it is. <laughs> You're very talented in that regard, in that respect. Well, listen, thank you so much. And um, maybe we'll speak another time. Absolutely. Thank you ever so much.